I think this next story will be really interesting. We've had a bit of uh, livestock bashing um, and now we've got someone who's very keen, very keen on his sheep and also made some really interesting efficiency gains, I would suggest, um, in terms of those capital investments both in the cropping but also in his sheep enterprise. So we're just going to show you a five-minute video again of Andrew Buffler from Lockhart and then it's, it'll be your opportunity to really drill him about why he loves his sheep so much. <laughs> At the moment we've shifted back to about a 50-50 in land use between livestock, which is only sheep, no cattle, and uh, cropping. Um, within the livestock, uh, we run two seed stock operations, a White Suffolk and a Pole Merino stud. Within the cropping program, it's, uh, I guess there's three or four aspects of that. We have grow canola, wheat, barley, and uh, wheat with a grazing um, element, with the uh, grazing wheats, which are becoming a big part of the uh, mix as well. With regards to the cropping enterprise, I've identified that as probably a weakness and it's simply innate in me. It's not something that I'm overly interested in and so as a result um, I employ a consultant. A few years ago when I went through a partnership breakup with my brother I just realised I didn't have the time, inclination or capital to try and have a full sowing and harvesting plant. Um, so I've got what I would think is one of the better croppers in the district so he's allowed my, me to bring my cropping part of my enterprise right up to the cutting edge of technology without all that investment in time. So I do what I do well. I've put things in place to make sure that cropping enterprise happens to the best that it, that it can. Sheep aren't anywhere near as labour intensive as they seem to get the rap for. Um, I've invested heavily in a good set of Prattley yards that sheep run through and work well. I've got invested heavily in electronic ID, ID tags, um, computer software and things to capture all this information that I get, um, a peak hill sheep handling machine, so um, yeah, it takes a lot of the physical work out of it. So it's just a matter of um, investing in your sheep enterprise like people do in their cropping enterprise. I see a lot of opportunity um, in both the enterprises. Um, the synergies between the two of them um, really, really work well and I think if I pushed anything too much the other way then I wouldn't have enough grazing wheat in the cropping program to shoot this system and I wouldn't have enough loosen in the, in the um, grazing enterprise to be uh, building soil fertility for the next cropping phase. I'm not a fan at all of chasing trends and whatever. Canola prices are great this year, but I'm not about to put my whole cropping program into canola. I'm a, I'm a big fan of um, sticking to your program and doing it well. Um, I've got about a thousand acres of good dry land loosened under sown and up and running now that I want to put a, um, um, a, a watering system and an ele electric fence system so I can really fully rotationally graze um, that country. And then when it comes back to the cropping phase, just you're still nothing. You've still got big, good cropping size paddocks with nice big straight AB lines. Good improved pastures are really the engine room of our whole enterprise. When you get good established pastures like this, it gives you great ability to get your genetics and everything to really perform to their potential. In the good years, you can cut fodder, the surplus. There's a lot of advantages, but it's also day in, day out. It's just fixing nitrogen and just fertility for the next cropping phase. Mandy and I are a, certainly a husband and wife team. Um, we, we make the decisions together. We spend a lot of quality time together in the sheet yards. A lot of the decision making really has to be uh, within the context of how comfortable you are with yourself and how well you sleep at night. Along with Mandy and I, we do like to use a network of professionals and things like that and um, obviously your accountant, um, you've got your bank manager and you've got your network of peers um, using your local resources like the local university and EH Graham Centre and um, your local district agronomists. I have had the last 12 months, a, um, 18 months, a full-time employee. But once again, predominantly, he spends a lot of the time doing the spraying or fencing and things like that and lets us specialise. 95% of the sheep work that we predominantly are doing, it's, it, it requires two labour units, generally Mandy and I. I'm often doing the physical work and the things, and Mandy's capturing that um, data and uh, recording it. I'm certainly a lot more conservative than I was 10 years ago. I guess 10 or 15 years ago, we decided with um, we're benchmarking everything else that we're going to crop everything and everything had to be really productive and use everything to the, push it all to the 10th degree and if you needed to buy in hay or oats and you simply buy it in but I've gone a full circle on that we do conserve a lot of um, fodder now. 
just on the cost side of the business alone, by running a 50% sheep enterprise, in any one year, it's a, we've got a lot smaller gamble on the table than somebody's doing 100% of the cropping. Probably five or six years ago, we got to 75, 80% cropping, uh, 25 to 20% um, sheep. And then we had those run of droughts and everything else, and uh, that just, I felt, left our business hugely exposed. Um, Climatic variability and things is, a, is probably the biggest risk component of our enterprise and I didn't like hanging 80% of all those upfront costs and things like that on the line year in year out on the hope of a spring. I certainly seen the sheep thing as genomics come online, it could be just the next massive big jump like superphosphate was. And I can see no real technological big jump forward in the cropping part of my enterprise. So when I look around the district and look at clients I really feel in the most of the mixed farming enterprises that I see, a very large percentage of the opportunity rests in the livestock side of their operation. The sheep enterprise and industry has been moving along and going forward with te technological advances and productivity gains, but a lot of sheep producers or a lot of particularly mixed farmers haven't really been embracing it. Um, when I look at our business, I'm starting to think that we can have very little influence on commodity prices given that we're price takers with our commodities, very little influence on production given it's so rainfall dependent and that's just what falls from the sky but the cost you've got a really lot of control over. For me this new shed that we built last year symbolises to a degree why I'm a committed mixed farmer and the, and the, and the benefits and synergies. I would have had a lot of trouble economically justifying building this shed just to put the machinery and my capital in it. Um, I needed a new shearing shed would have been very difficult to justify the cost of a standalone shearing shed. And I also needed a ram selling complex for our stud sales. And so when I bundled them all together and um, looked at the project, all of a sudden it was very easy to be able to justify this capital improvement. Okay, so that's a bit of a different story to Bruce's story. And Andrew's obviously very passionate about his sheep in a in a non-New Zealand way. Um, while you think about your questions, I've just got one question. Andrew, it's a pretty innovative approach you've taken with the cropping. You've said that you didn't have the time, the capital or the incentive personally to spend time in that business. And you've gone, I'm assuming it's a, it's a neighbour that you found or someone close by. H how did you arrive at that innovative approach? Uh, desperation, I I guess. I really didn't want to buy a whole new sowing thing. And with a couple of seed stock operations, uh, look, we're very performance focused and we have to capture that data. And that whole data and everything springs off date of birth, getting the date of birth and lambing type and everything. Because every other bit of data we capture depends a little bit on those things. And that was also clashing with, in the sowing period. So um, it was an easy decision to make. Um, <laughs> To be honest, I was sport, sport for choice. Um, as Bruce said, most guys have a lot of testosterone or something and like huge big machines and things. And I would think within 10 kilometres of me, I could have approached six or eight people with a huge amount of spare capital in their business. They're way overcapitalised. Um, I found a guy is a good friend, which has its own issues, I guess, and you've got to make sure you put things in place pretty tightly so that friendship gets um, protected. But he had a lot of capacity. He had a I'm with my three blocks, he's got a block to the west, right next door to me. He goes right past our main block, heading to his further east to another block of his. And so the season, if it is such a thing as normal, tends to go west to east and we can just time it. And he's right next door and he's got every bit of GPS technology and everything. And he's madly keen passionate. So a bit like Bruce, I picked up a contractor, but also picked up a labour unit because, and, and well, he's got two full-time staff, so to agree at sowing, there's three labour units that I'm not paying for that I'm doing my sowing. But he's really, really good at what he does, and he knows more about seed placement and things I just can't believe. I think he's broken down half the time, and I'm going, getting on the two-way and going, what are you doing? Well, I'd be half finished that paddock by now, and he's still checking the depth or the pressure of the um, press wheels or something and I think just bang it in and she'll come up sort of thing. So I pick up all his uh, expertise and things a lot. So it was, it's been a really, really good fit. Interestingly, is he involved in the decision making processes of your cropping business as well or do you just tell him what you want done? Not officially, but he's a very um, particular 
bordering on anal, I don't think you'd mind me saying, sort of person when it comes to his cropping program, which was a really good bonus for me. And once or twice with, with the chemical, I'd still do the spraying ahead of the thing. Or, and um, most of our spraying I do, get a little bit of contract in if I get behind. But, you know, there's been times he's always just questioning what the go is or what about this. And he, uh, once or twice he's picked up a wrong chemical mix or just something, or he suggested it mightn't be a good idea to put that chemical... You know, it was a post emergency. I don't really. Once again, I, I follow my consultant scripts pretty pretty closely. It's not something I do. And uh, look, he couldn't get the concept at all. And he must have brought up the subject three or four times. One time, I desperately needed to get a pasture established on some loose country that I that I'd had that I'd got an opportunity to buy that was really really run down, and I couldn't risk putting a cover crop or anything on it. Well, it drove him insane. He must have told me 10 times that maybe we could just put 20 kilos of barley across it or something and things, because he just could not get the concept. So, uh, look, he get, he's, a re he's a really good farmer and he's a really good cropper. So he does have that consultancy element to him as well. And I don't pay for that. Don't tell him I said that, though, because it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Two ladies watching it on the web. That's right, in his tractor. Ted Wolf, uh, Graham Centre. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, there must be... I'd just like to try and explore with you a little bit about the partnership agreements between you and your sharecropper, mate. Um, there must be th times when you have to, if you like, almost develop special arrangements. I mean, you depend so much on pastures. And, and he, so... I presume he's doing the pasture establishment or sowing the, sowing the pastures for you. How do you share the costs and things like that? Are there any special features that, let's say, we ought to know about in terms of that business partnership arrangement? I'm not sure I've made it clear. It's not a share farming arrangement. It's just a straight contract arrangement. So it's simply him coming in. And it is very important because he's a friend as well and it's a business arrangement that we do have a very strict start of date timing and when we're going to do it and what the rotation's going to be, where we're going to be at, um, through the process for both of our places. There's a plan put in place before we start. So if a four-inch rain event looks like it's going to be coming and it might be the last chance we get a thing, he doesn't abandon my place and go to his. There's a, there's a strict... Before that emotional decision-making has to become, there's a pretty strict itinerary of sowing or a calendar of sowing events, I guess, in place. Um, it was, Andrew, it was very, uh, Peter Winnie in CSU, I'm just, uh, I was very interested to hear you say that, uh, oh, we've got a, a whole genomics approach to uh, improving our sheep. Uh, it's really simple for the croppers because uh, plant genetics is ever so much easier to, br to breed uh, a crop that is either resistant to a disease or yields 30%, 50% more than the pre its predecessors. What are you expecting out of uh, our scientific community, that is if we uh, maintain a, a sheep scientific community, uh, what are you expecting out of genomics uh, in terms of improved productivity of sheep? I guess just touching on what you alluded on first of all, it's, that whole debate really frustrates me. The, 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 thing that, the thing that you could even be having the debate about whether you would invest into this thing, by definition research, you don't necessarily know the outcome when you start the whole process, else it's not research. If you knew the outcome before you started, then it's already a proven science. So how they can be saying that there's no pathway to commercialisation and that only 15% of sheep producers are going to benefit from it, it just beggars belief because we don't even know what the outcomes are going to be, but there's already some incredible science. Um, I've been involved with the information nucleus with genetics in there right from the start and we've been getting research breeding values back. So I've been right at the coalface and just something as simple as parentage, which is now being able to be done, and, and, and a pole gene, which is completely identified, of whether it's a polled or semi polled or horn genes. And, and just early in those early days, there's a lot of really beneficial things coming. I disagree to a, to a certain degree with the portion of your question in the sense that there's massive, even before genomics, there's been massive gains for the producers that want to be using ASBVs and things. And, um, the daylight between those producers and the more traditional ones that maybe David was talking about 
is, um, is getting greater and greater all the time. And uh, there's been genomics. Some things we're not going to know what it discovers until we actually get used to them. And, the, and the, 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 it's as, who knows where it's going to win. But the really big thing is it only is going to build on ASBVs. We've already got an amazingly powerful tool in breeding values, and it's going to breed on it. And for me, um, certainly with labour, with parentage and labour and par on the farm, the amount of time and effort that Mandy and I spend simply getting parentage and things like that, if that can be done at the blood test, it's incredible. But for genetic gain, um, even the research breeding values, uh, to a degree, they're sort of saying with the, with the blood tests and things, now on a six-month ram lamb, which I've been doing, I can get a degree of accuracy on the traits I've been measuring, plus some hard-to-measure traits, meat eating quality and worm resistance and things, to, to, to the level at six months that as if it was an old ram with 40 progeny on the ground that had been tested, which is generally a three and a half, you know, three, three and a half year old ram. So just generation intervals within, just the, how it's going to speed up the tools that we've already got, let alone all the unbelievable new things it could possibly bring online, plus the labour savings and things. It's just the potential, as I said, it's, it's, it could be a huge big step forward that you know, probably David was alluding to that maybe the sheep industry hasn't been doing it, but could be able to pick us up the 50 years that we might behind the cropping program in a five-year period. It's the most exciting thing, and that's why I just love sheep and being involved in it. It's an unbelievable technology that's right just getting into our hands. Andrew Ashley White, uh, GPI, who works in the sheep industry. So I'm really keen for you just to talk a little bit more about the bad rap that sheep get in terms of labour and uh, how, you've, uh, how you've addressed that. Um, and, uh, yeah, basically, I, I guess, bit leading on from Tim Hutchins' comment, is capital cheaper than labour in a sheep enterprise? Yeah, look, there's no point in me sitting up here and saying I haven't got a reasonably labour-intensive um, enterprise. With the two sheep studs, with the obsession and passion for recording everything that's recordable, uh, to make sure we get the productivity gains in the right areas and we take all that environmental noise out of it. Uh, at the moment, it's reasonably labour intensive. Um, we've been going through electronic ear tag process and things like that, and maybe David was a bit smart not being an early adapter. He mentioned he's not going to be an early adapter in a lot of things. It hasn't been all beer and skittles. Uh, getting the softwares to talk together and, and being able to get it through sheep genetics, and you know, Mandy and I. Um, generally get on pretty well in the yards and things, but most tension and most problems have come with trying to get some of this technology to work. But after three years, we're finally starting to bet it down. And with, look, that sheep handling machine that we've got there, it's got scars under there, and just any time that we do anything, a drenching and inoculating or anything, we can get a live view weight just automatically without any extra work or anything like that. We can just, she'll be scanned and weighed, even though we're not specifically, that's our job. Um, being able to draft into, in time into labour groups and things. and. While we're so intensive with the studs and a, and a lot of individual things, in the commercial area, the same technology, like to be able to have walkover weighing at watering points and things like that and know that your target market's a 24 kilo lamb, so when your lamb's hit 48 kilos, they're ready to go and you can hit a computer and see that you've got 20% of your lambs have hit that weight and then you just buy your phone, program the thing to, instead of just walk them over to draft off those lambs. And you'd go down there in your truck and you load up your 48 kilo lambs and head off the market. No mustering, no anything, no weighing, just, you know. All this electronic thing, and Bruce alluded to, um, you know, maybe those younger people, it's a bit trendy and things. Well, there's a hell of a lot, and I disagree, which I often do with Bruce because we did enough field together. Um, with there's not a lot of young people, I went to Lairmex, 700 people down at Lairmex there recently, and honestly, 500 of them were probably under 40. Uh, and really keen about the genomics, the electronic ID, treating a mob of sheep as a thousand individuals instead of as a thousand sheep. And uh, there's certainly a lot of technology and, and things that, but there is limitations and, you know, a shearing handpiece is still a shearing handpiece and, you know, that just comes with the game, I guess. Thanks, Andrew. We've got time for one more question. Any brave operators here? And I do want to remind Condo at this stage, we're still uh, keen to get questions from you, if you're interested. All right, another opportunity for me, Andrew. Um, you talked about the fact that you feel that you're a lot more conservative these years than you used to be. What has actually driven that? Oh, I like sleeping at nights, I guess. Um, look, the droughts really 
it's probably going to that run of droughts is going to redefine my um, whole cropping program and my whole farming philosophies. Um, you tend to remember two days before Christmas writing out cheques because you've forward sold too much or you've made the wrong call and you've got to make margin calls on fancy grain marking tools and things and um, buying in hay at ridiculous prices and being worried that there might be slugs in it that we haven't got from South Australia and really doing a lot of biosecurity checks and a lot of time and effort and things and um, you know, selling grain for eighty dollars a ton, then buying it in at three hundred and fifty six months later. That those kind of life lessons tend to hang with you for a, for a fair while. And um, you know, Dad, I get quite frustrated that we don't have enough respect and time for the generations that came before us. Um, in a broad sort of a way. I guess on the whole forum today, we live in a, in a really defined sheep wheat belt and I think a lot of our forefathers came and tried cattle and goats and rice and irrigation and peaches and apples and everything. Most of them failed and what really worked in our area and what gave us a bit of comparative advantage was sheep and wheat. And um, I see a lot of people, particularly maybe under 20 or 30, just think that there's some wonderful new, whole new, 100% cropping world out there that and they're a little bit smarter than the generations before. I live my life in the world of genetics and things, and you don't often make huge genetic gains in anything, and I don't think this generation's made huge genetic gains in intelligence yeah. uh, compared to our father and forefather. And, you know, I should have listened to the old man more, I guess, because he was always very conservative. He said, you always got to have those couple of silos of oats or barley, and you've got to have your haystack full of hay and things like that. And my brother and I were a little bit, no, that's a load of crap, we're going to grow wheat world to wall and we're going to make a lot of money and you know if we need a bit of a hiccup then we're going to buy it in and uh, you know he was right and I was wrong and I'm happy to admit it that uh, for me I'm, a, I'm going to be a lot more conservative and, I, and I'm going to sleep at nights knowing that I've got those that hay there and that grain in the silo and look more often than not that grain that you put aside for a rainy day and things it's a, it becomes a good marketing strategy and you're actually marketing the physical instead of marketing something you don't have and if you don't need it you might actually you know, make a few extra bob along the way on your grain side of your program. So it's just, once again, a nice fit and, and synergy. OK, Andrew, thank you very much. And um, it is a bit of a sad lesson that we have to keep learning these lessons generation after generation, isn't it? OK, I'm going to give you five minutes now for a buzz session. Uh, we have, s on the screen over here, we have Helen Byrne putting up ideas and things. Well, we did, until I wanted to talk to you about it some ideas and things to discuss. But I really, again, I really encourage you throughout the videos to write down the ideas as they come to you, write down the things and the points of interest and you're happy to leave that paper at the end of the day. It's really helpful for us to, to, to take those messages away so we can better understand what's interesting and what the issues are for you. So I'll give you five minutes now for your buzz session on ideas, issues and just how you felt about that session. Then we're gonna break for morning tea.